Hello and a warm welcome to this week's edition of Invest Africa. I'm Alicia Sekum. Well, after celebrating 46 years of independence from the United Kingdom, the Republic of Botswana has had four decades of uninterrupted civilian leadership, progressive social policies and significant capital investment. This has led to the creation of one of the most dynamic economies in Africa, but the country also has one of the world's highest known rates of HIV AIDS infection and other socio-economic challenges as well. This week we take a closer look at the opportunities and challenges that this Southern African country presents. Spanning over 580,000 square kilometers and bordered by South Africa, Namibia and Zimbabwe, the Southern African landlocked country of Botswana is home to around 2 million people. Tourism, financial services and agriculture make up Botswana's economic sectors. However, diamond mining has been a key revenue generator and currently accounts for one third of GDP. Almost 80% of export earnings and about half of government's revenue. Copper, nickel and soda ash are other export commodities to countries like Zimbabwe, South Africa and Europe. Import partners include France, South Africa and Sweden, from which it sources food products, machinery and textiles. Botswana's heavy reliance on a single luxury export was a critical factor in the sharp economic contraction of 2009, reflected in the negative GDP growth of 4.9%. However, the economy rebounded strongly, aided by improved global demands for diamond. The economy grew by 7.2% in 2010 and was slightly weaker at 6.4% in 2011. Botswana's economy is predicted to slow to 4.8% and 6.7% in 2012 and 2013 respectively, in line with global trends. Botswana is still faced with high levels of poverty, inequality and unemployment, as well as high HIV AIDS prevalence rates. Although there has been a decline in the proportion of the population living below the poverty line to 20% from 30%, the poverty level is still considered high for a middle income country. Botswana is addressing these challenges through a number of poverty reduction initiatives, which involves implementing job creation programs. The country is also making significant progress with its targeted Millennium Development Goals, especially regarding education and gender empowerment. Dumisho Makhanyele, Johannesburg. Now joining me in studio to take a closer look at Botswana as a business and investment destination is Terence Dumbe, Managing Partner at Minchin and Kelly, Johan Mering, CEO of Blue Financial Services, and joining us from our bureau in Cape Town this afternoon as well, Craig Featherby, Regional Manager for Africa at Deveria. Thanks uh, to you all for joining us uh, today. And uh, perhaps, Terence, let's kick off conversation with you because your company provides legal services within Botswana's borders and while you cater to to Botswana citizens, foreign investors uh, form very much a part of your clientele as well. So from your liaisons with them, what's sentiment like when it comes to Botswana as an investment destination right now? I think generally the, in, the sentiment is quite positive. Um, a lot of positive information has, is available in terms of where Botswana stands um, from various angles in terms of rule of law, in terms of governance, um, in terms of stability. So I think the outlook generally is quite positive when um, people look at Botswana. Um, in your insert you talked about certain, um, there's obviously with every positive there are some negatives, but generally the outlook is quite positive. Well, let's hear from an investor. Uh, Craig, you're one such foreign investor. What was the appeal of setting up shop in Botswana? Originally, when we, we looked at Africa, uh, we looked for long-term sustainability in creating a, a long-term sustainable business. And we initially set up our operations in South Africa. Uh, and then when our marketing team started researching Africa, the obvious choice was Botswana. At that stage in 2009, according to the World Bank, uh, Botswana was the fastest growing economy since 1965. And therefore, the obvious decision was to initially start our Southern Africa expansion from uh, Botswana. Mm -hmm. Well, Johan, you also invested uh, very much in this country. Blue Financial Services, a microfinance uh, institution servicing the formerly, un uh, well, formerly employed but underbanked and underserved employees. Uh, the investment case that Botswana put on the table for you, because uh, from what we're hearing right now, it seems to be its stability corporate governance more so than anything else that uh, stands out? 
Yeah, I think Botswana is also, as, as we heard in the insert, has gone through a process or rather good GDP growth um, and it's also anticipated for, for that to continue. Mm -hmm. And as we heard in the insert, um, if you have periods of good, good GDP growth, uh, there's also a widening of the gap between the, the haves and the have-nots automatically happens because some uh, obviously participate and grow the, as the GDP grows and, and others are, are left behind. So from that perspective, um, Botswana has not done that well in managing some of the uh, inequalities as a person can see in some of the other economies th which a person can compare with. Mm -hmm. However, that also creates opportunities. So from our perspective, uh, in the first instance, we were able to provide um, financial services to people that participated in, in, in the growth side. And at, at this point in time, we believe there's a good opportunity of also widening our products on a more developmental basis to deal with some of these equality issues. Yeah, and that's certainly very interesting where we're looking at a medium-sized country with a population of just over, what, two million people, uh, you know, with one of the smaller populations in Africa, one would assume that it uh, boasts limited scope and potential. So, just a myth. Yes, yes, there is. I mean, if you compare Botswana on, on absolute numbers of people to, let's say, Nigeria, one of our other operations, it, it's, I mean, we, we're talking significant differences in uh, Nigeria, let's say 160 odd million people. Mm -hmm. But that does not imply that a person cannot uh, grow one's business profitably in countries where there's uh, smaller populations. Yeah. Uh, Terence, you have a special focus uh, you know, on the establishment of new business entities, corporate commercial law as well, uh, property law. When it comes to setting up shop in Botswana, just how much red tape is there? Because of course that lends to the tale of ease of doing business in this country. Yes, I think that's one of the challenges that um, um, does come up from, from business people and from investors is um, a lot of the red tape that does exist. Um, in terms of one, at the moment, the hot topic is the issue of residence permits and work permits mm -hmm. for, for skilled, um, for, for, for workers, for expatriate workers. It's something that is ongoing at the moment. Um, in terms of um, how quickly you get um, companies registered um, and all those processes. So those are just an example of some of the challenges that are there and that are issues that the government is looking at. Right now, the government has, in terms of work permits, just as an example, work permits and residence permits. They're looking at, they've introduced the point system and there's a whole review and discussion around that point system in, in order to try and improve the process. Um, in terms of companies and registration of trademarks and things like that, the government has now um, put into place law to establish um, a, a statutory body, um, a parastatal that is going to deal with um, the and registration. And here you're referring to the Botswana Export Development and Investment Authority? That's, that's, that's something separate. That's mm -hmm. a separate issue. Um, and, but that, that, that is the, um, the, the, what you call BEDIA, what you're yeah. referring to. There's another issue around that because that has now been merged with the International Financial Services Center, which is another topic that we might get into. Mm -hmm. But in terms of, and they bid, um, that's called BITC. And BITC, one of the things that they are doing is that they are trying to push government to try and make the environment a bit more investor friendly. Mm -hmm. And they're quite heavily involved in this whole process of dealing with the work permits and, and improving the investment climate. Mm -hmm. Craig, uh, you've uh, been in Botswana since 2009, and uh, like I've highlighted, yes. you know, we've had these uh, bodies being uh, formulated, the likes of Badia, now we've had uh, Terence highlight uh, BITC as well, and that to encourage, you know, a one-stop investor service center to assist uh, investors with everything they need to actually do business in the country. What note have you made of the kind of evolution we've seen when it comes to red tape and bureaucracy in the country dealing with those issues effectively? I, I think as Terence mentioned, um, there, there are the ongoing issues with regards to regulation and, and, and visas and setting up companies and so forth. But uh, a part of the De Vere Group's philosophy is to actually work with uh, the governments. And so when we initially set up in 2009, we spent the better part of six months actually sitting down, liaising, communicating, uh, communicating our objectives, communicating what our businesses and our business practices are all about. And, and we therefore welcome it. And uh, another group that recently has just been in the process of being set up is ABFA, uh, which is a, a financial services body. Uh, and therefore, 
um, Botswana is not going to get it right first time and therefore mm -hmm. I think being part of a global organization um, or all, all organizations we need to try and do our bit to ensure that uh, the environment that they operate are, is going to be conducive to be able to run a successful business. I've noted that uh, you, Craig, have had the backing, uh, the global backing uh, from the uh, Devera Group and uh, that support coming through global infrastructure, for example. Just how much of a make or break is having that kind of support? I think for me personally has been absolutely phenomenal. Um, we have 69 officers in 45 countries and therefore the challenges that I face in setting up offices in Africa, uh, originally Botswana, are not new to the organization. And therefore, dealing with visas, dealing with corporate governance, uh, accounting issues and so forth, uh, is certainly not new. So therefore, having that backup um, both uh, uh, intellectual backup together with financial backup has been, I think, one of the major keys to our success in Botswana. As I said, Johan, we've had uh, Craig's organization, of course, seeing that global backing. Uh, what were the risks of going it alone in your case? Uh, if you mean going it alone in the sense of just going to Botswana and mm -hmm. starting out, I think that would be very difficult. Um, if, you from, if you're not obviously from Botswana and you want to go, go to a country and just start an operation there, so I think to try and understand that some of the things Craig were talking about, having the experience of how to open up in a country, what is the best way of dealing with the regulators, understanding what is the best way of getting to grips with the subtleties and dealing with a country. I, it's not for the faint-hearted. Yeah, no. not for the faint-hearted, mm -hmm. but uh, you know, if the checks and balances are done and the right boxes ticked, uh, you can actually make a success of it. Uh, to illustrate that kind of success, I mean, just how much of a contributor has earnings from that end become relative to what you rake in from your what other 11 territories you operate in? Uh, Botswana has been very good to us, um, but I think in, in context of what I, what I was trying to say is that Fortunately for us, by it was one of the first operations that Blue started, which was uh, be before my time. Mm -hmm. But um, I think today, based on the total regulatory environment that has been created, um, and there's a lot of new regulations being created in the financial services industry as well in Botswana at present, which has caused some of the smaller players to close their door. So. I think uh, understanding of what the, the objectives and the spirit is of what the regulators are trying to achieve is, is really important. Yeah. But um, we, we, we're extremely comfortable with our operations in Botswana. Terence, I was reading through your company profile and I picked up a line. Long experience in the Botswana market has taught us that over-specialization is counterproductive. Mm -hmm. Explain what you mean there and you know, how that lesson was learned. Yes, I think um, over the years, Mitchell and Kelly is one of the oldest firms. And what we had found was that um, with a lim in a limited economy such as Botswana, when you over-specialized, it's almost impossible to try and target one area, mm -hmm. right, as opposed to the bigger developed economies. So we found that we had to try and, um, though we try and be a niche firm, we had to try and make sure that we cover a wide spectrum of areas in terms of um, the legal services that we can provide. Um, as we've gone along and as the economy has grown, we have specialized more and more. Um, so historically, we are always looking at our model to see, um, and I think a lot of other big firms um, are also looking at their model to see how you can um, specialize to provide the services that are required. Because Botswana, I mean, Minchin and Kelly goes for as far back as 1890. But um, Botswana has transformed even in the last five to 10 years. So we are constantly looking at that. And I think the era of specialization is coming forward. So even that statement would be reviewed within the shortest possible time because the, it, the economy has developed in leaps and bounds and the level of legal services that are required has, um, has changed dramatically. Well, perhaps well. the lesson that you have learned, a lesson for Botswana itself to learn with such a focus on the diamond industry, the mining industry as well, and much mm -hmm. pressure being exerted to actually get that economy to diversify. We'll mm -hmm. be taking a closer look at the diversification of this economy straight after the break. At this point, Craig, we say goodbye to you. Thanks so much for having joined us uh, today. Craig Featherby is Regional Manager for Africa De Vera, and we're heading into that quick commercial break. There's more on Invest Africa when we return. Stay tuned.
Welcome back to Invest Africa. According to a recent report in the African Review, given threats of dwindling diamond reserves, Botswana is looking to end its over reliance on mining and is exploring the prospects of economic diversification. The diversification of Botswana's economy has been made a priority in the government's current economic plans. In an attempt to diversify the mining sector, the country is looking to beneficiation as an option. It is therefore critical that the benefits of mining help to create a broad-based and robust economy beyond mining itself. Beneficiation has an important role to play, provided it is based on a sound business case. Coal has presented a viable diversification option because of its export and electricity generation capabilities. The Coal Development Unit is expected to facilitate development of the entire coal value chain. The National Economic Diversification Drive Strategy is an initiative also intended to enhance productive capacity of local firms. This is also expected to contribute significantly to job creation and economic growth in other sectors of the economy. Beyond the mining sector, we are looking at tourism. Uh, we are trying to attract as much investment as possible into our tourism uh, sector because it has mainly been concentrated on ecotourism. But there are other areas where such investment can take place. We are looking at becoming a financial services center. Uh, this is a high potential area uh, which our economic position can support. Embarking on this endeavor doesn't come without challenges. The need for a conducive regulatory framework along with cohesion in administrative processes still poses a challenge. For example, in the diamond industry, it has required of us to take very courageous decisions, such as relocating the Diamond Trading Center from London to Habarone. It took very strong negotiating uh, positions to achieve such a kind of thing. Uh, it also requires provision of infra infrastructure for the cutting and polishing factories and all the associated administrative uh, structures to enable uh, that kind of beneficiation to take place. Despite these challenges, it is of huge importance that Botswana develops other sectors of its economy. This will help cushion the negative impact on its economy whenever the global market takes a knock. Dumisho Mahanyele, Johannesburg. Well, still with me in studio, Terence Dambe, managing partner at Minchin and Kelly, and Johan Mehring, who's CEO of Blue Financial Services as well. Terence, we've had this on the agenda, diversification of the Botswana economy for the longest while. Beneficiation has been on the agenda for the longest while. How do you rate the stride that's actually being made in this regard? Because we've got the same old challenges being cited still. Yeah, there's no doubt that the issue of diversification is not a new one. Um, over the years, the government has tried in various ways to try and div diversify the economy with, um, I think, honestly speaking, limited success, as you can see from the reliance, the continued reliance on diamonds. But there are opportunities that are coming up. Um, your insert spoke about the issues of coal, um, from not only from the coal itself, from power generation, possibly um, with the kind of coal deposits that we have in Botswana. I think that presents quite a huge um, opportunity in terms of even exporting of coal. Um, exporting of power so that that is something that I think will help and some people will say you know it's disputable but some people will say coal is the new diamonds for Botswana but it's still mm. within the mining sector of the economy so what are some of the other investment hotspots that are opening up yeah some of the things um, that they're looking at for example they've created the the, the, the Botswana um, innovation hub um, where they're looking at services, they're looking at um, bringing in ITC, uh, ICT um, um, in terms of providing services, in terms of innovation, in terms of ideas around that. The government is putting quite a lot of money into that to try and diversify from diamonds. Mm -hmm. um, you have, um, as the insert spoke about, what was called pre previously the um, IFSC, International Financial Services Center. It has merged with BEDIA, the investment promotion yeah. agency, to form the Botswana um, Investment and Trade Center. Now, now those are initiatives government is taking 
um, in order to try and diversify. There's still quite a lot of work that needs to be done, um, and there's quite a lot um, to try and get investors to understand the benefits, because if you look at the benefits that are there, mm -hmm. they are there, but um, it's a question of trying to facilitate. Absolutely. And try and, well, um, like you say, those mm -hmm. mechanisms are being put in place, and uh, mm -hmm. certainly we've seen government make additional uh, uh, stride in terms of a privatization of state entities as well to encourage mm -hmm. foreign investors there, where you're hand amongst the key sectors that have been highlighted along the way has been tourism, agriculture, and then of course the financial services space. A player in that space, give us your view of the operating landscape within the financial arena and just how competitive a landscape we're looking at. I think the Botswana landscape is extremely competitive. There's um, uh, I think quite a diverse amount of um, people providing financial services uh, from banks through to institutions like ourselves. And if I can sort of backtrack to one of your previous questions about uh, the amount of people and the amount of investment required from a Botswana perspective, and if I take my example of Nigeria, I suppose one of the fortunate positions that we are in is because we operate in, in 12 countries, we can in essence develop processes, technologies and everything associated with that, um, which is then distributed between our different uh, areas of operations, which puts us into a position of actually investing more money into a specific country than we would have done if it was for that country in, in isolation. But coming back to your question, I think with the, the, the growth that has been in, in Botswana, there's been a lot of people that started accessing uh, more uh, being banked and mm -hmm. being better serviced, and people accessing loans and purchasing a, a large variety of things from that, from that. I think the one thing which has possibly not had sufficient attention is more, uh, let's call it developmental financing, in the sense of provi um, pr provision of housing, um, loans for education mm -hmm. and things like that. So to a certain extent, the more a person is concentrating on the consumption side of things, there will be a portion of the population that will be serv serviced. But a person should also look at the developmental side because that's mm -hmm. the only way a person can look and how microfinances ac can actually only truly be utilised. Johan, where we've highlighted through the course of the show that uh, you know high levels of poverty persist, we've got an unemployment rate of 20% that we're looking at over in Botswana. What skills base are we looking at to cater to the private sector? Is that a challenge for doing business in the country? No, I actually think more it's an opportunity. Um, if a person looks at the, the, the inequality and uh, Botswana's uh, uh, Gini coefficient, which is quite large for, for it, and possibly a person can take note of uh, some of the uh, South American economies and what initiatives the governments have, have taken there to try and, by way of example, um, based on attendance of going to school, uh, people get um, subsidies or the family get certain subsidies, which happens in, in some of those countries. And, and what it does to a certain extent, it, it, it forces people to get more educated and the more educated people are the, the smaller the inequalities yeah. become and uh, obviously our we, we're not performing the services that, that a government must, must perform but uh, let's call it the, on the up end of that we are um, very close to launching our education products which yeah. I, I think can possibly in some small way contribute. I raise the point Terence because mm. I've been reading that despite the fact that education ranks high on the list of priorities for government education expenditure sitting at what 8% of GDP mm -hmm. it's not created a skilled mm -hmm. workforce for the private sector to make use of. Yeah, I think um, there's, there's no doubt if you look at the education sector, the government has put quite a lot of emphasis and money into education and the number of qualified people is quite high. I think it depends on where you're looking at in the spectrum. Um, quite often I know some of the mining houses have said that the education in terms of technical education they found a bit lacking mm -hmm. um, in terms of um, obviously the, the mine, mining houses have said look you should emphasize more on artisans and that level of education but I think your standard education will find that there's quite a high, um, a high rate of qualified people um, you know at, at even at the higher level I think there are certain sectors that will complain that there is a lack of education um, and a lack of training which the government's trying to assess I know uh, some years ago mm -hmm. they used to say there's a shortage of accountants um, and the government created the Botswana Accountancy College and that is improving um, so there will be certain sectors that will say look we have a shortage here but by and large I think um, it's really more a question of how you target 
yeah. your education towards those sectors that need that. And um, areas like the Botswana Innovation Hub, one would think that provides um, you know, opportunity. So for, work for in progress mm. that we're seeing. Unfortunately, mm. gentlemen, not nearly enough time mm -hmm. needed to unpack the opportunities and risks that come with investing in a country like Botswana. But we're going to have to end the conversation there. Thank you so much for having joined us uh, today. You. Of course, uh, that is uh, Terence uh, joining us, of course, uh, coming all the way from Botswana, I should mention. Terence Dambe, managing partner at Minchin and Kelly, and Johan Mering, CEO of Blue Financial Services as well. We'll be back same time, same place next week. Until then, from me, Alicia Second, it's goodbye.